Good evening. Hope that you grabbed a, co a copy of the chart back in the four years you came in. We want to study together the allegory of Hagar and Sarah. We've been studying types and shadows, and so this certainly goes uh, right alongside of that. <clears throat> An allegory is simply a series of actions that are symbolic of other actions as uh, types and shadows, types and antitypes and shadows and such as that as we've been uh, looking through. The background of Paul's writing to the churches of Galatia have to do with the fact that Judaizing teachers had made inroads in those churches of Galatia. And so some of the difficulty that they were facing, they were uh, having burdens bound upon them, such as circumcision, such as keeping the old law, and so forth. And so the Apostle Paul, in writing that in chapter 4, especially of Galatians, deals with that particular topic. And so I want us to, to look together tonight and and we'll, we'll do our best and we'll kind of uh, go through the chart um, kind of side to side as we've done uh, in the past. Uh, but ultimately, two women are mentioned here, but he's talking about also two covenants. And so he uses these two women as well as their two sons to discuss two covenants. And so I would like to read beginning in Galatians chapter 4. And so if you'll go ahead and be turning there, Galatians chapter 4, and we will start in verse 21. And remember that this, this part of this discussion in the previous chapter has been also obviously about the law, the law of Moses and the law of faith. And so that discussion took place, but... They discuss the purpose of the law, to bring them to Christ. And so then part of uh, a continued discussion concerning this in verse 21, he says, uh, Tell me who you desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. And that's something that obviously is going to keep coming up as we go through this and as we look back and forth uh, throughout this allegory. He says, which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar, he says, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. He says, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband." Now we, brethren, he says, as Isaac was, are children of promise. And so, in again, keeping with the purpose of the writing of this letter to the churches of Galatia, dealing with that problem of those who are coming along and saying, you've got to keep the old law. You've got to be circumcised in order to be saved as well. And adding that to what they already had as a new covenant before them, he, he's saying that, folks, we are, as Isaac was, we are children of promise. And then he says, but as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. And so he's talking about that persecution that's taking place. And we'll make that point in just a moment. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. They could not continue, they could not 
alongside of each other, be there as heirs. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free woman, if you continue the ellipsis there in the sentence. And that's why, as we read this morning, Galatians 5 and verse 1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and not be entangled again in that yoke of bondage. And so this is part of that discussion. Part of our uh, references will go back to Genesis 16, Genesis 21 as well. And so you'll be able to, to kind of jump back and forth. Uh, but I wanted to read through Galatians. And so we have that kind of as the basis for the things that we are looking at in this particular uh, lesson. And again, uh, as I've tried to put out there before, uh, these charts that I'm using are from W. Gaddy's Roy, uh, his books on types uh, and shadows. And uh, it is excellent. Uh, if you can find it, it's a little getting a little bit difficult to find, um, but there are some that are still out there. Uh, Brother Gaddis Roy did uh, an excellent job in this particular book, as well as a book on miracles, which is a little more difficult to find, and a book on parables as well. And so, if you can get your hands on those uh, three books, they are excellent, excellent studies. And so, um, just that doesn't cost you anything. That's that's free. Anyway, all right. So we're looking together then, uh, thinking about what's taking place, uh, asserting the fact that these mostly Gentile congregation, that these Gentiles must also then be circumcised and must also keep the law along with the other teaching. Paul now says he, he presents the law in this allegory. And so he comes alongside, if you will, and shows that the two covenants that are in question, the old law and the new law, those two covenants. He says, we can go back and we can look at Abraham and what took place with Abraham and Sarah. And we can discern certain things. And so uh, this is how it is laid out for us. We know Abraham would have ultimately two sons. He would have Ishmael, uh, who was born to Hagar, the handmaid. And then Isaac, who was born to Sarah in her old age, uh, the Bible tells us. Abraham, uh, evidently, as well as maybe Sarah, uh, they were impatient in their waiting on that promise. Uh, God had promised that they were going to have a son. And through that seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 and start reading about that promise. We know that uh, Sarah would say uh, to Abraham... Here is my handmaid, Hagar, uh, to be your wife. And through her, he would have a child, Genesis 16 and verse 3. And so he was one that was born, Ishmael was born, as the chart says, uh, after the flesh, born to the bond woman. Abraham and Sarah's son was the one who was born by promise. And again, going back to Galatians 4, 22 and 23, uh, we see that. He who was of the bond woman was according to the flesh. He of the free woman through promise. That promise. And there's something about that that keeps coming up throughout this, uh, this whole conversation. And as it is concluded, one of the things that we are going to note that we too then are children of God through that promise. And so uh, that's going to be part of that uh, conclusion. That all brought about by a new covenant. We also see then uh, Hagar, who is the handmaid. She represents, according to this allegory, the old law, that old covenant of bondage. And what's interesting about that is that throughout this conversation, throughout this, uh, this letter of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is, is making that point about that, that bondage. He keeps bringing that up, that it was... That it was going back into bondage to be bound to that old law because of those rites and ceremonies that in fact were under it. When in fact we have liberty through the promise of Abraham and through a new covenant of Jesus Christ. And so he is going back and forth and making that point very clear. And so while you have Hagar, the handmaid, who represents the old law, 
you have Sarah who represents the new covenant, the new covenant of freedom, in fact. Under point number two, you have Ishmael who by a fleshly birth, as we've talked about, he represents, and Brother Gaddis Roy makes the point here, he represents uh, ultimately a, a Jewish church. And so what do you see? You see two sons. You see one born uh, by natural birth and then one born by promise uh, that was given to them by promise. And that, of course, being Isaac. And on the other side of that, we see then two churches. You have that, that Jewish church coming about by that natural birth, following that lineage Eventually from, from Abraham, they're going to be given that old law uh, directly to uh, his descendants. And ultimately then, we'll be looking at the church of Christ. And so when we talk about churches, essentially we're talking about uh, part of that Jewish uh, gathering and, and collection of those individuals who were still following the old law versus the Lord's church, who were following the new covenant, the new testament. And so those being born again through that spiritual birth, uh, born of spirit and of water, according to John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5. And so again, you have this, uh, this comparison, this back and forth, looking at the two sons that were born to these two women and ultimately bringing about the Jews as well as uh, or making comparison to the Jews who were still under bondage because they were following the old law and the church of Christ at that point following a new covenant who had freedom, spiritual liberties uh, in Jesus Christ. But under number three, then we get to the point you have these two sons uh, of Abraham and, and what do you see by that? You see two social classes, or two social ranks. You have Ishmael who is in domestic bondage. Now he had, obviously, he was born into that, uh, born to that handmaid of Sarah's. Isaac, though, domestic freedom. And so in that house, uh, he was born of Sarah, who was the free woman, as Paul is making clear in Galatians chapter 4. But when we think about then, not just two social ranks, we're looking at two spiritual ranks. Again, you have the Jewish church, that Jewish group of people who are still trying, that are still bound, if you will, by that old law. Now, that old law has been nailed to the cross and put away, but they're in bondage to it because they're still trying to hang on to it. And so it is no longer uh, leading them to Christ, which would have served its purpose in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. Now, because it's no longer in place and no longer serving that particular purpose, it is rather going to lead them to spiritual death. And so you have then the church of Christ who enjoys spiritual liberty uh, in, uh, in Christ, in the body of Christ, in fact. And I've already read Galatians 5 and verse 1, but notice verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty... Again, that idea, you've been called to liberty, that freedom that is in Christ. Do not use liberty then as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, he says. And so you, <clears throat> when you start making this comparison and thinking about these, the two social ranks as well as the two spiritual ranks that uh, Brother Roy uh, compares here, you have this idea that it shows even a, a further superiority of the gospel of Christ is what it does over the law of Moses. And this is what the comparison is all about, is about these two covenants, the law of Moses versus the gospel of Christ, which is another way of just simply saying the new covenant, the New Testament, that system of faith by which we are saved. And so again, you see the superiority of the gospel of Christ over the law of Moses. And what I find most interesting about that, and I want to look at a couple of passages together, is the gospel of Christ is not something that's just attached to the law of Moses. And I'm afraid that that's probably the way that the majority of the religious world views the Bible. They see the old law, the Ten Commandments, and they see then the new covenant as something just attached to that. And therefore, it's just a part of that. But we have to realize that, and there's a reason that 
that, that page in between is, is there to separate between the Old and, and New Covenant. That's uh, one of the most misunderstood pages of the Bible, that there's, that there's a difference between an old law and a new law. And the book of Hebrews does a, a fantastic job by inspiration to make that clear. Uh, in fact, I, I want to go to a couple of uh, passages, and beginning in Hebrews chapter 8. Let's go together to Hebrews 8. <clears throat> We don't have time to, to cover it all, but Hebrews chapters 8, 9, and 10 uh, really uh, also makes the, uh, the crux of this argument, if you will. And so uh, whether or not this is Paul writing or some other writer writing Hebrews, uh, the arguments are much the same. And really uh, probably even uh, brought out even more in depth, even in the book of Hebrews. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 8. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says, Now the things which we have spoken, he says, This is the psalm. We have such an high priest, verse 1, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest, he says, is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, whereof it is of necessity that this man have someone also to offer. And so if Christ is going to offer something, he needs to have something worth offering. He says, if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Why? Because they are of the Levitical tribe, right? And he was not of the Levites. He was of Judah who serve unto, he says, the example and shadow. So the Hebrews writer is making clear here that we have an example as well as a shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished, he says, of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much more he is also a mediator of a better covenant." which was established upon better promises. And this again, that, that same idea, that promise given to Abraham as well. He says, And if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And, and that part of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 being uh, quoted here again. Notice this point that he's making. Uh, the fact that he has obtained a more excellent ministry, there is a better covenant, he is the mediator of a better covenant, established upon better promises. That's talking about Christ in that particular passage. Then he goes back, the Hebrews writer does, in verse 7, and he says, if that first covenant had been faultless or without fault, what was the fault of it? And, and understand that when God has made a law, it is a perfect law, essentially. It was perfect to the purpose in which it was intended. But the fault that's seen in it is the fact that it could not save mankind. It had a purpose to bring them to the Savior. And so there is a difference in them. But also then in verse 8, he says, "...in finding fault with them." So there was also fault with the people who were trying to follow that particular law as well. And so he says, the day is coming then when I will make a new covenant, not according to the covenant, verse 9, that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, write them into their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Those who follow that covenant have learned, in fact, that covenant. That's part of the new covenant teaching that has to take place to be a part of that. He says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins, their iniquities, will I remember no more. In that, he saith, a new covenant. He hath made the first old and now that which is, or that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And you could go on and, and, and like I say, go on into chapter 9 and chapter 10. But the conversation is, is basically the same. It continues on and illustrating it even more in depth uh, about these two covenants and the differences between them. 
And so thinking about then the two spiritual ranks, we're looking at uh, the Jews being in legal bondage, ultimately. Whereas those who are in the Lord's church, they are enjoying spiritual liberty. There are two characters, according to number four on our chart here, <clears throat> Ishmael and Isaac. And so when you look at the two characters, we see Ishmael, according to the allegory that Paul is writing, he says Ishmael was a persecutor. Isaac is the one being persecuted. But he flips that and he turns around and says that that's in fact what's taking place. That the Jews have become the persecutors just as Ishmael was. And ultimately, those who are in Christ, they are being persecuted. And so you can begin to see uh, those two things taking place uh, on the other side of that. Two characters as well as two dispositions. But let's look at number five together. Number five talks about two physical inheritances versus two spiritual inheritances. There were these inheritance, they represented or are represented by Paul in this allegory. Ishmael received a slave's portion. If you go back to Genesis 21 and verse 14, he received a slave's portion of bread and water. But Isaac received the full bounty, if you will, uh, the full possessions and blessings that his father had for him. And you can go to Genesis 25 and verse 5 and notice that. The Jews, it had, they had inherited the land of Canaan. But in this allegory, it is represented that this was, in fact, the slave's portion. This wasn't the full bounty of God's blessings. This was for a time to have this nation, to ultimately raise up the Christ, the Messiah, who would be the Savior of the world. Christians, though, inherit all of God's favor and all of God's blessings. Where so? In Christ, right? Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Romans 8, 28, John 8, 35, Galatians 3 make this all very clear that we, in fact, enjoy those blessings. Uh, why? Because we are uh, inheriting in, because we are Abraham's seed according to verse 29. If you are Christ, then you are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so we get to enjoy all the blessings in Christ. It should also be observed that God said in Isaac. So it's very specific in those passages back in Genesis 21, Genesis 25. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. It's very specific. Romans 9 and verse 7 gives reference to this as well. And this, by the way, powerfully refutes uh, Islamic doctrine, uh, Muhammadism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Muhammad was of Arabic descent. He was supposed to be and most likely uh, was a descendant of Ishmael, while though the promised seed of Abraham was never going to be through Ishmael, it was going to be through Isaac. And that made very clear in Genesis 21 and verse 12. And so you can see even the defeat of uh, Islam and Muhammadism in these passages. Number six on our chart, you see the, the two were cast out. Hagar and Ishmael, neither received an inheritance with the son of the free woman. And so, <clears throat> again, talking about that inheritance, when you think about the two are ultimately cast out, the allegory stands in place for that old covenant and fleshly Israel unless they follow the son of promise. You see, this is why I said earlier that if they continue to follow, that, that ultimately Judaism, that was, that, that was, they were under bondage by continuing to try to follow it because it was going to lead them ultimately to death and not to life any longer uh, because now in place was a new covenant. And so the old covenant nailed to the cross, Ephesians 2 and verse 15, Colossians 2 verses 14 and 15, uh, the Apostle Paul makes that very clear in those passages. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 4, though. <clears throat> Galatians 4, beginning of verse 28. It says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac, are the children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Those were to be cast out. 
the old covenant and fleshly Israel. What I think a lot of religious people today get caught up in as well is the idea of God's chosen people and assume that that still today is, are the Jews. For a time it was. And that's part of what Paul is talking about right here. No longer is that the case. And that being in the first century. And here we are, so many years removed, centuries removed, and still folks are trying to go back and, and hang on to some of those very same things, which Paul has refuted uh, in this and the previous chapter of Galatians. And so uh, Hagar and Ishmael, they received no inheritance with the son of the free woman. The old covenant brought about a penalty for sin, but the, the, the best that the Jews could ever expect uh, in, by way of forgiveness was to offer their animal sacrifices. And every year, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 3, there was a remembrance year by year continually of those things. So they were never really freed from those things. The law with fleshly Israel ended, and the Christian inheritance then is seen with spiritual Israel. No longer fleshly Israel. Notice with me real quick, <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Some folks have difficulty in Romans chapter 8 uh, because they get caught up with um, trying to uh, delineate between um, how the Spirit is working in this but also realize that uh, the Spirit is being used here uh, in comparison to that old law and, and fleshly Israel, uh, essentially. And so you have the flesh and the Spirit and part of that conversation. But it says the Spirit, verse 16, bears, itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so he says, and if then we are children of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And so again, just to, to, to pick up on uh, the conversation that is taking place uh, with Paul, uh, both in this letter and obviously then even in Romans chapter 8, as well as the Hebrews letter, Hebrews chapters uh, 8, 9, and 10, this is the conversation. And we have to expect, I guess, and, and give a little bit of uh, credit to uh, the difficulty that must have been such a challenge for Israel, for the Jews. All that they had ever known was that old law. And then to see something new come along uh, in the way that it did. And, and it's easy for us to say, yeah, but you had the Christ right there in front of you. And you had the apostles and the miraculous abilities that they had. And that should have clued you in that this was directly from God, directly from heaven. This was a divine revelation given to you. You should have followed it. But when this is all that you've ever known, you can see the difficulty, why it caused so much trouble in the first century church and why Paul dealt with it. Everywhere that he went, you have these Judaizing teachers who were following him over and over from one city to the next when he was preaching the gospel. He comes along and he preaches about the gospel of Christ and how to be saved from sin and not just how to be saved from sin, but to be free in Christ. And then have those Judaizing teachers come along and say, no, we're going to put you back in bondage now because you need to keep the law of Moses and you need to be circumcised as well. And so that difficulty, we can see uh, the, the difficulty that was taking place because it, by inspiration, there is much, obviously, that is covered in the New Testament that deals with it. And we see it over and over. Under number seven, you see the two that remained in favor. Obviously, Sarah and Isaac, the child of promise, as well as those who remain in favor, the new covenant, and Christians, again, by promise. Uh, Acts 3, verse 25, again, Galatians chapter 3 uh, is a great treatise on that. 
I want to get down to number eight here in our chart and finish up with this thought. Ultimately, what we begin to see, and I want us to go to Colossians chapter 2, and we'll look at Ephesians 2 and, and look at how they are compared. These are sister letters, Colossians and Ephesians. And what you typically find in one, you typically find in the other. Uh, and so, um, though it may be worded just slightly different, um, maybe emphasizing something different, yet the point is still being made. Uh, and so you find this over and over. So in the Colossians letter, you have, <clears throat> beginning in verse 12, Colossians 2, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein he says, you're risen with him through faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, you being dead in your sins and un the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. Took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Reference to the old law. Having spoiled, he says, principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And then he goes, and let's just compare here the Ephesian letter. Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> And notice the similar language that is used here. An easy way to remember the conversation or passages that we might be able to show someone about the old law. Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2, and both of them are in verses 14 and 15. Ephesians 2, <clears throat> and, and what I'd like to do is back up here to verse 11. Because all of this conversation, again, written primarily to a Gentile congregation. So it says, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in flesh, he says, made by hands, that at that time you're without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ. So something has changed. Christ made the change. He made the difference. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off, which is reference to the Gentiles, are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. And so when you see that afar off or near, typically you're thinking about those near would have been the Jews, those afar off, the Gentiles. You're made near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace. He hath made both Jew and Gentile one. And he's broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. And folks, that's about as clear as you can get, beginning to realize that both the Ten Commandments are part of that old law, and all of those things together, he says, he has abolished in his flesh. In the Colossian letter, he says it was nailed to his cross. What's the purpose? To make in himself of two one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And so in this we see the old covenant, while we certainly have it, Romans 15 verse 4 teaches us that we learn by it, that it gives us hope. We, we look, we're able to look back and to, to see those lessons. And Romans 15 verse 4, the Apostle Paul very simply says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So we have those things that were written aforetime. We have the old law. And it's written for our learning. So we gain so much from it. In fact, how difficult would it be to understand what in the world the Apostle Paul was talking about when you read Galatians chapter 4 if you didn't have the Old Testament at all? You wouldn't have a clue what he's talking about. But through the Old Testament, obviously, we gain knowledge. We learn from it as well as it gives us hope. But we're, no longer, we're not bound by it. In fact, 
we were never bound by it. The new covenant remains. It is in effect from the cross. It became in effect. And as such, that's what we today have to follow. That's what we are bound by, is that new covenant. That's where we go to for our authority. But I want you to notice also then, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Because in this, 2 Corinthians 3, again we pick up on the purpose. 2 Corinthians 3, beginning of verse 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. He says, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And again, you can see the contrast between the old law and the new. That's what he's talking about. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, it's obvious what he's talking about there, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the the face of Moses for the glory of this countenance, he says, which glory was to be done away. He's saying that, that even as glorious as it was, that was seen by the children of Israel by way of the fact that, that Moses had to veil his face, he says, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit, this reference to the new covenant, the New Testament, be even more glorious, or rather glorious, the King James says. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. That's the point that is being made here. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by the reason of the glory, he says, that continues to excel. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more That which remaineth is glorious. He says that which is here then is of more glory than the old, the new covenant. It's unfortunate that sometimes people will make comments about us. Well, you don't even believe in the Old Testament. Absolutely we believe in the Old Testament. We believe in the Bible from cover to cover. But we have also uh, figured out how to separate it. It's very simple. There is called an old and there is called a new covenant. And that new covenant made by the blood of Christ is for the remission of sins. And the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians, he says, that was not the purpose of the old covenant. The old covenant served its purpose. It was fulfilled in Christ He came to fulfill the law, right? It was fulfilled in Christ because it was to bring them to the Christ. And once that was accomplished, there would be no need for it to continue by way of authority. It's there for our learning. But for authority, we go to the one that Christ's blood brought about. And that is the new covenant, Matthew 26 In verse 26 through 28. And so when we think about these things, Christians are saved under the new covenant and have become heirs, as we read there in Galatians 3 in verse 29. And as such, when you think about then where we stand, are we children of God? That is, have we put on Christ in baptism because we believe Jesus to be the Son of God and because we were willing to repent of our sins and confess Him before men? And that act of baptism puts us in Christ. And Galatians 3 and verse 27 says that as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have you done that? And then are you continuing to be faithful as we talked about this morning? Are you living a faithful life in Christ? If not, then repent of those things. Ask for forgiveness. Let us encourage you. Let us help you. And if you have a need, please come to the front while we stand, while we sing this song.